I'm Christina Musson with KMJ Radio, and I'm joined with Ryan Wood, Superintendent of Emanuel Schools, Jennifer Bursch of Tyler and Bursch, and let's get started. So Ryan, I want you to take us back to the beginning of the story, and that means going back to March, which is a hard thing to do sometimes, but let's go back to March when um, the pandemic closed schools, closed the economy, and start from there of what happened in March when schools decided to close and what led us up to today. So back on March 16th, we decided to close and we kind of did it reluctantly. Most schools closed the Friday before, but we felt like at the time we didn't have enough information. So we wanted to figure out, okay, is this gonna be as serious as I said? And so we felt like to be a good neighbor, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know if it affected kids. And so we decided to close. And I, on March 17th, my admin team looked at each other and said, okay, if, if this was the wrong decision, and this turns out to not be as widespread as they say it is, then we have to really consider what does opening school look like? Because they're saying 15 days, but we have this sense that it could be longer. And so we, even on March 17th, we had made a decision if we have to open school against some guidance that we just felt like that was what we were gonna do. And as we went through the online learning, I feel like our staff did an amazing job making schooling from home as positive, as academically rigorous as possible, but we realized really quickly that it wasn't the same. As a Christian school, the relationships and all that was just missing. And so it only strengthened our idea that we have to really consider what is next year gonna look like if this, if this continues. And what we did in the meantime was we decided to have a live graduation for our seniors. We decided to have a live promotion for our eighth graders. We did that out of conversation with our families. We did that out of what we felt was best for them. We felt at that time we could do the social distancing and offer the mass and, and meet the guidelines as they were intended. And so we did that. And I believe we might be the only school in the area that did that. But again, we are in partnership with our families and we felt like that's what we needed to do at that time. And it really kind of strengthened our idea that we need to open school. And so in June, we just started planning. We started looking at guidelines that were out. The goalposts kept moving, but we kept moving with them. And uh, when we got to July 17th and the governor closed the schools, Tyler and Birch, we got an email from, uh, from a gentleman we know that showed they felt like we could still legally open as a private school. And so we just kept going. August 3rd, he included private schools. And that was the point where we had to say, okay, we've put in all this time and this effort. Our families have been very clear through surveys that they want their kids back on campus. And we made a conscious decision that we're gonna open on August 13th. And we knew that our date was early to begin with for school. We knew that we were gonna be kind of the tip of the spear, but we had prayed and we had seeked counsel from medical experts. We had talked to other educators. We had talked to our parents. And we just felt like this was what the Lord wanted us to do. And we were willing to take the risk and open school. And so by the time we got to August 13th, people had caught on, the health department had caught on. And I understand that they didn't want us to open. But at the end of the day, I'm responsible for 650 kids. The Lord has placed them in my care, my admin team's care, the board's care. And when our family said, this is what we want, and we had done all the reading and looked at all the data and realized it wasn't as big of a health risk as we thought with that age, right? Zero to 18, five to 18. We just decided, you know what, we gotta do this. And I had no idea what it would become, um, but we, it wasn't just like we got to the 13th and said, we're gonna open. It was months of praying, of seeking counsel, of talking it through, looking at the scriptures, trying to make sure that what we were doing as a Christian school wasn't going to be viewed, even though it was by some, it wasn't going to be viewed as this rogue school trying to, you know, push back against the government because that was never our intention. It was to open because that was what was best for kids and our families asked us to. So in that planning stage of things, as you're saying, okay, this is the decision that we've made, now bringing kids onto campus in a time where the governor has shut things down, we need to make sure that we're doing it, I'm sure then, to the best of our ability. So what was part of the planning process then and the things that you said to yourself, this is what we need to do in order to safely bring kids back on campus? We started looking at guidelines. We started to understand the social distancing. I think a mask mandate had gone in there at some point and I'll explain why we didn't start with masks. But we started looking at all the things that they were asking schools to do and we thought, you know, we can do this. We're a smaller school, we have smaller class sizes. 
we can do this safe. I felt really confident in the staff that they would want to teach, they would want to be here. I was confident in the admin team that they would, we would know exactly how to progress with it fulfilling those guidelines. And so we just started making a plan, a reopening plan. And we didn't have any intention of sharing that uh, or having that approved by the county. We just said, this is what we think a manual needs to do to open safely. And we spent hours and hours and hours doing that. And in the process of doing that, one of our own parents approached us and said, I think you guys might have herd immunity. I think COVID has gone through your school in January and February. And I said, hey, I'm game. Let's, whatever you need from us, we will make it happen. And we got 200 volunteers and we did a legitimate above the board antibody test. And we, and through Dr. Majin proving we had herd immunity, that was one more thing that strengthened us to say, the risk is even lower than the average school because we've proved that it's run through the school. And so all those things together, we really honestly felt like we could open school safely. And at that point, without masks, because we were leaning on the idea of herd immunity, that if it's come through our school, which we proved through absence reports, then why are we risking all the other things we know that are happening with the lack of, you know, the physical activity, the, the emotional anxiety, the stress that kids were going through, the lack of their learning. There was a whole list of things that we said, okay, we could get a COVID case, but we can handle it this way, or we can stay closed and all these other things we know are happening. We just felt like the pros and cons for us, it was an easy decision. We'll take the risk with someone getting COVID and handling that in the appropriate way, following the CDC guidelines, having the contact tracing, all that stuff in place. We, f we felt far, that risk was far less than the other risk of not having kids back on campus. You kind of mentioned how Tyler and Birch came into your sphere, but talk a little bit more about how the two of you were introduced. It's a great story. We, uh, we had been talking to Cody. We reached out to Tyler and Birch after we got the email and we loved the fact that they had the loop, not a loophole, but they saw, look, it didn't, uh, private schools can still open. You have the legal right to open. And we're like, the legal right? Okay, let's go with that. And so Cody, one of the associates, was uh, the one we were talking to and we knew that there were two partners. And so Cody was having a surgery, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And we asked him to zoom in with a board meeting because we were, it was, we were making decisions. It was like, we're gonna keep going. So I had the board and Jen zoomed in and we had already sent our reopening plan to her and we knew that not having masks was gonna be a problem for their firm to represent us. And at that time we were looking at a lawsuit against the state and she zoomed in and got a sense of the craziness of our board. We have fun. Um, but in that meeting, I mentioned herd immunity and I, I'm not kidding, Jen's kind of sat up, kind of leaned into the camera and was <laughs> herd immunity, can you explain that more? And when I went on to explain it, she says, you gotta be kidding me. I, I think we're gonna represent you. And at the time we felt like, and we still do, and it hasn't been recognized, that was real science. That was real data. And we felt like that needs to be recognized. To this day, it still has not been recognized, which is frustrating. Dr. Majin has been very gracious Things have been said about the, the test, but that's how we really got connected to Jen, and it's just developed into not a client lawyer situation, it's really a friendship, and she's just been a blessing to our community. What was going through your head at that meeting when you heard herd immunity? Well, we, at that time, I talked to, you know, over 50 schools about their plans and what that this is what we do. So I talked to so many and so many conversations and just heard the frustration of the schools, their kids, the impact on their kids. I have young kids at a private Christian school that I was trying to open at the time. So it's incredibly personal to me, but it we knew it was gonna be a struggle. So we were looking for schools that were willing to comply with the guidelines because it at least made the argument a little bit better from a legal perspective. And I was concerned about winning. Um, so when I got on the Zoom that night, it was actually at night, which I almost never do because I do have young kids and it just doesn't fit in my schedule. But Cody had said, you know, I don't know. I just think you should hop on for a half an hour. Can you just do it for a half an hour? And I said, all right, I can do it. Um, so I just got on and yeah, I really liked, um, I guess, Ryan's spirit and the herd immunity aspect of it for sure. I definitely did sit up and I definitely called Dr. Anmajian and learned all about the tests that they did. But it also was just who they are that um, 
it really was about getting kids back on campus, which I'm passionate about as well on a personal level, and I believe legally it's accurate and correct that they should be on campus. So it has, it's been great, great to represent them. Um, it has definitely developed into a friendship, and it's been a, been a long road, but um, I've stayed in it the whole time and honestly not given it to an associate or anybody else because I just believe in what they've done, what Emmanuel has done, and um, have a lot of respect for Ryan and the board and the stand that they took and really the way that they took that stand and the integrity that they've shown throughout the process. They are unique. I have to say that when I heard herd immunity myself, I thought that's wild. That's wild. It is. I, because this is a Stanford had studied it. I mean, there's a lot of schools that have studied herd immunity, right? But when Dr. Atmajan came out and said, what, 60% herd immunity, I thought to myself, that's just, that's wild. I mean, what did you think when you heard that? Well, and, and, uh, and I get a great opportunity to clarify, that's 60% of having two of three antigens. If you count one, which is what the county or the state or any other institution would And everyone count, else tests for. Would be 80%. So we had 80% based on what the norm was for everybody else, but to have 60 for two of three was jaw dropping. And he was so confident when I first met him, met with him regarding herd immunity. He goes, I, I guarantee you went through your school. He goes, I think you might have 80 to 90% herd immunity. And to have that come true, uh, instantly for me, just like Dr. Majin went way up on my respect because he called it, he knew it, and he felt it. And then to have our community, 200 people come out and volunteer between students and staff and families. It, it, again, it was, it was just showing the love of our community to try and get our kids on campus. And, and, and of course, families want to know, did I have it? Because I remember going in January, and I remember going in February, and I remember having this respiratory thing and being sick for two weeks, but it wasn't the flu. I heard that so much when we closed. They would drive up, you know, for drive through pick up. They would tell us, I know I had it. I know I had it. And you're just kind of smiling, OK, OK. But then to have it be proven that it did go through our school, and then after we did the test, we did the absence report. And it was jaw dropping, the increase, 100% increase in some grades from the previous year. 50% was the lowest, I think, for some grades. That was only validating what we knew in our hearts, what Admajan had proved. And that's why it's frustrating that he hasn't gotten the due respect in the media and from the County Department of Health, because it, it's, it's legitimate. And we looked at it as it's good for Emmanuel, it's going to help us get open. But what if other schools could do this? Right, we realized kind of early on that our story was beginning to be other people's story. And we thought, man, if they could just take the science for what it is and other schools could do that, they could get open. But it just never materialized like that. And so we still look at it as one of the major reasons for why we opened though. Absolutely. Yeah. You've been open since August. Yep. Any cases of COVID? Zero. Yep. Zero. We track, and I said this on the radio show, I think, before, but we track every symptom of every kid. We track every absence. When a student uh, needs to stay home, and our, and our parents have been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like, for the slightest thing, our kids are staying home. They have three siblings at the school. Unfortunately, they have to stay home, too. But that's, again, that's not asked of us. No, no county department asks us to do that, right? They don't have COVID, which initiates quarantine. They just have, they're just not feeling well not even COVID symptoms. Our parents are keeping them home. We keep the siblings home. We have tracked everything. And to be honest, we haven't even been close to a COVID case in the sense of our students and staff and faculty. Matter of fact, I think we've had one parent and that was work related and had no bearing on the school whatsoever. So you're talking about 600 kids that are on campus. You're talking about 84 staff and you're talking about all those parents. And we've had one case and none of it is related to the actual campus. We will be the first to say we believe that's the Lord's provision, um, the health of our campus. But even if we did, we never once claimed that we wouldn't have a COVID case. We were fully prepared. We have forms. We have processes. We have everything in place. If someone was to get COVID, we could trace it with our new nurse, Robin Torres. We could trace it. We can isolate it. We could keep the people home. We could communicate. We had all of that in place. So, and I believe other schools would too. And so people look at it and like, how could you possibly open? What if that happens if you get COVID? 
well, are we not going to open life here? I mean, we had plans for everything and felt like, worst case scenario, we would be ready for it. And if we would have had an outbreak, we would have closed school. Because we're opening because we think it's best for our kids. We think it's the healthiest option for our kids. But if we would have had an outbreak, we would have closed. Because that's what would have been the best for our kids. And I think other schools have that same mentality. And, you know, there were people, which is shameful, were wishing for us to have a COVID outbreak. They, well, they said that to us. I was going to say, ask you, so I'm sure that you've heard from people that agree and disagree with this decision, yes. parents and community members. Yes. Um, overall, though, what have you been hearing? What's the word been from oh, mostly? Well, I made a commitment after I read every tweet and every response for graduation promotion. I made a commitment that I wouldn't track anything. So I, I'm probably the last person you need to ask. I haven't read or watched her. I think being on your show is the only time I did anything. But my admin team keeps me somewhat informed. And, and it's, it's gone from, like, how could you do that in the beginning? Right? You have the two factions. Yes, good for you. Stick it to the government, which, again, wasn't, we weren't interested in that to how could you possibly, they should charge you for whatever, right? I've heard they should charge you for murder, crazy stuff. That's fine, people are, they have their opinions, they have their choices. We gave our families choices. We said, this is what we're gonna do based on your, the feedback we've gotten from you. If you don't feel comfortable, we're gonna give you an online option. I hired three different teachers to offer an online option so that families that didn't feel comfortable could do the online thing. And then we, we lost a few families. And I'll go back to, that's their choice. They have that choice to come to a manual, to not to come to a manual. They have that choice to be angry at me or the board. They have that choice to disagree. But what I have noticed, based on what admin has told me, over the weeks we've been open, definitely a lot more positive. I think partly because I would like to think we've proven you can do this. Like, you don't need to be overly scared, that you can do school and you could have no cases. We haven't had any cases. I'm not saying that's gonna be like that the rest of the year, but it certainly what wasn't what most people thought, some wanted, which is despicable to think you're wishing COVID on kids, but that's been said. I think we would have liked for, for people to go, how did you do it? What, what are the things you're doing? Because we need our kids back on campus too. And so, we're, we're not engaging, we haven't engaged, we're not trying to persuade people who don't agree with us, biblically or just opening, it's not our style. We did what we felt was best for our kids, our families. I think we've proven to this point you can do it safely, and we just kind of leave it at that. It's not important for us to be right. How did we get to this point of settlement and what exactly has been agreed upon here? Well, we started with the county suing Emanuel for opening its doors in person on campus. And in response, we sued both the state and the county of Fresno, um, arguing that they're the state mandates and the state guidelines, which were trying to force Emanuel shut um, to, or to shut their doors on campus, were unconstitutional. So we kind of started there. We went through a temporary restraining order attempt by the county um, that we were able to win and that pushed it back and allowed Emanuel to stay open for three weeks. And then a preliminary injunction was granted against Emanuel um, stating that Emanuel had to close and Emanuel decided to stay open again with the thought that their kids needed to be on campus. And, you know, from my perspective as a lawyer, it's unconstitutional um, and they should be allowed to be open. It violates the Equal Protection Clause. It really is beyond the bounds of where the governor should be as far as the Emergency Services Act and his authority to just literally create law in the back room of the governor's office on a website and put out these guidelines that they're you know, asserting our laws. Um, there's just so many questionable things about it, but that led us to kind of a stalemate and we were just at a point of you know, Emanuel's going to keep going. We were going to keep going. But the county actually reached out and said to me and said, let's have a conversation. And we did. We were able to, um, at that point, the county was in red, which means that the county can open schools within, after two weeks of being in red, they have to be in for 14 days, then they can open schools. So at that point, the conversation turned to, 
we're going to be able to keep the doors open, what is it going to look like on campus and how can we work within the guidelines to satisfy the state and the county? And I just came to Ryan and said, I think we can do that. My reading of the guidelines was different than the county's originally. And we went through a weeks long process of working through that and what that would look like for a manual and eventually was able to reach a settlement. So what changes on campus then? Well, we agreed to do that. We knew that all schools in California were going to have a mask requirement. Um, and we didn't do that in the beginning because of the herd immunity. So that was a tough pill for, for me personally and, and the board and the admin to, to swallow, really. I, we, we just felt like we didn't need them. But we understood the guidelines, and that was one of the key ones. And so we actually started doing that well before we reached a settlement. I think it was September 21st. It was a Monday. We started... With, a, with some updated things to our plan, the big one really being the mask. Um, when they came and did the inspections, I wasn't in a mask. I mean, they, they just pointed that out, and I understood why they're doing it. That's a guideline. And so we, we agreed, you know what, let's, let's put in some things in good faith. We're not, we're not here for, a, we're not trying to battle. We're not trying to just push back to push back. We're trying to keep our kids on campus. So we started wearing masks September 21st. We made some other adjustments. Um, which was hard for us because we felt like up to that point we were doing fine. But the goal and my responsibility as superintendent is to keep the kids on campus learning. So at the end of the day, one, I got to make sure I'm honoring the Lord. And two, my job is to keep kids on campus learning. That's fulfill the mission of a manual, which I don't feel we can do to its fullest extent without kids on campus. So we just started looking at ways that we could meet guidelines. Jen did a phenomenal job helping us understand what the guideline was saying. I'm pretty black and white, so I was reading them sometimes to our detriment, and she came in and said, well, let's, let's read what this is really saying. And that really helped me agree to some things, and our admin team to agree to some things that we just couldn't agree with up to that point, because we understood, okay, I understand what they're saying. Things like symptoms, you know, symptoms of a headache versus a COVID symptom. We hired a nurse this year because we knew we were gonna open. Um, and we needed, we needed expert help in tracking that and understanding what's a headache and what's a COVID headache, what's, right? And so as I began to understand that and the admin team understood that, it made it easier for us to say, oh, you know what, we can agree to that. Because by nature, we, I mean, by nature, I'm stubborn. I'm gonna tell you right now. But I have other people on the admin team that were like, we've gotta keep kids on and I just can't agree to that. And as we began to understand the guidelines, Jen did a great job of saying, I think we can agree to that. And so over time, there were things that we gave up that we feel in no way, shape, or form is affecting the education of the students. We were unwilling to give up anything that was going to affect the education of our students. And we were very transparent and honest from the beginning, even in the negotiations. Even when we were going to open on the 13th, we told the county, we're opening school on the 13th. Even when we got the letter on the 13th, we're going to be open on the 14th. We never have lied in this entire process. You can agree or disagree with us opening, but we've been honest about what we're doing. And we wanted to make sure if we came to any kind of settlement, that that is something that we could do and, and it wouldn't affect education. And it took a while. I mean, there were some hangups there. There were a couple of things that we were willing to walk away from. And I think the state was willing to walk away on a couple of things. And, and by Jen being persistent and knowing the wording and helping us word things, um, we were fine with what we ended up with. Uh, splitting chapel, we can do that. Splitting recess, we can do that. Splitting lunch, we can do that. Things that we honestly didn't feel like we needed to, but we felt like if that's going to keep kids on campus, that's really a small thing uh, to give up. And so we did those kind of things, and we feel like, we are able to continue to have kids on campus for the entire year, all kids, the entire year, for some, for some adjustments that the state wanted. We readjusted our academic calendar. So we took some days off and readjusted our calendar, which we were fine with. We understood why the state wanted that. We understand why the county and state want what they want. We get it. We're not, I may not agree with it, but I understand it. And we found ways to work around where we didn't have to sacrifice what we wanted and they got what they felt they needed and we were fine with that. If we weren't, we wouldn't have signed it. So what happens if Fresno County heads back into the purple tier, let's say? So the guidelines specifically state that even if Fresno heads back to the purple tier, any school that's currently open when that happens can stay open. And only in relation to schools. 
That's not true of businesses and other things, but the guidelines have a specific provision. And that was one of the things that Gavin Newsom has said from the very beginning. If on July 17th, when he shut down schools, he said, if, you're, if you open, you won't have to shut down again. So it is one of the main things in discussing the settlement and negotiating it and working with Ryan and the admin team over hours to yes. figure it out and work through it all that I just kept telling them, you know, one of the things I respect so much about Emmanuel is that they had this goal of keeping kids on campus and they kept that front and center through a lot and a lot of back and forth and even the settlement. And that's really where I was coming in saying, hey, we can keep kids on campus all year because even if it slides to purple, we can stay open. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for Emmanuel and it helps um, them reach their goals, which is an attorney, you know, I'm advocating for them and for their position. Um, and I think we were able to do that here successfully. I've always been curious, Jennifer, when it comes to Emmanuel and what makes private schools different than public schools in the argument. Is it because it's private property? What was, what was the argument in case before the county and the state that made you say private schools are different? They are different. I mean, honestly, from my perspective, you should, public schools should be allowed to open under the equal protection law. The governor's mandates just have such a significant impact on underprivileged kids, on kids that um, have, you know, don't have English speaking parents or even dual working um, families. I mean, my husband and I both work. And when my kid was sent home in the spring, she didn't get a good education. I just can't do that. Um, I'm an attorney and he's an attorney as well and a developer and it's not, our lives can't just stop at a, you know, on a dime like that. We have clients and um, responsibilities. And I think looking at that and just feeling like every school should be able to open. Every kid in the state, from my perspective, should have the right to have the same education. That's a fundamental right under the California Constitution. So that's what we argued in the state case. And we argued on behalf of the Orange County Board of Education. I believe it's true both ways. However, I do think private schools are different as well. And I think that's because of their size and their ability to adjust. And that's what I was really working through with, with Ryan. He's, you know, there's not 2,000 kids on a campus where you know, social distancing isn't as possible and just all the um, adjustments they were able to make and the admin was able to make and even the teachers without a teachers union pushing back, their staff wanted to be on campus, wanted to be teaching those kids. And that is significantly different from public schools or most public schools at this point. I know a lot of public school teachers who do want to be in the classroom, but um, obviously we're seeing a ton of pushback from the larger unions across the state. And Emmanuel, it is different with private schools for Emmanuel, but it's also just different for most private schools. My kid goes to private school. They all wanted to be on campus. They are on campus now, but the staff wanted to come back too. I think that's largely true of most private schools we've worked with. So I do think it makes them stand apart. As we wrap up this discussion, I just, the last question I always ask is, is there anything that I didn't ask that you wanna, that you feel is important to talk about? Well, obviously, as superintendent, I would, I would be in error if I didn't tell you about how amazing the staff has been. I mean, it, it is a big deal that the staff has stuck with this process because it's been hard on them, too. I mean, when we lost the preliminary injunction, they were actually named as p potential people uh, to get fined. And that's a big deal. And I think over time, our staff, this has really galvanized us like it has our community. But I mean, the staff has been amazing. And they have been with us and they've been encouraging and they've had doubts at times, right? They've, they've wondered, what is, what is this, how is this gonna end? And what does this mean? And am I really gonna get fined? Could I really get a misdemeanor? And we, like all other things, we just come in here and we have very transparent conversations with them. And a lot of times it's, it's after a conversation with Jen telling me, okay, this is what could be, this is what the case law says, but the reality is this. And we would just go in and as a staff, they would get all the inside information. And I would say, hey, please just don't share this. They'd get it all because I needed them to understand, look, we see your fear, we understand that. 
And when, as we would talk through it, they would come up to me time and time again, or someone on the admin team would say, we're with you. Okay, we just needed to hear that. And that was the way the first day of teacher in-service was. Our staff in-service day back Wednesday, I think the 5th of August, was like that. It was, they walked in very unsure, rightly so. Because the admin team and I, we had been talking for hours on end all summer. We had come, we had reconciled the scriptural argument that we were going to have against us. We had reconciled the safety. We had read more data than I'll ever want to read again. We had done all that. So for them to come in fresh, we needed to encourage them and say, this is how we're going to do it and we can do this. And it didn't take much. And they said, we're with you. We need kids on campus. The turning point was when we actually had kids on campus. That was the turning point because it was the first sense of normalcy for our kids, for their families, for our staff, for us in admin to have a normal day of school, kids on campus. Two to three days in, parents are coming up to teachers, coming up to admin saying, I have my child back. I didn't realize how much of them I had lost the last three months, the last five months of being in lockdown. And I just want to thank you. And that only inspired us more to say, we have to figure out how to do this. And early on, we said, we told our parents, look, we may only have five days together. Is that worth it? They said, absolutely, let's open. And five turned into 10, turned into 20. I went in the TRO, gave us the extra three. And here we are 40 plus days, and now we have a settlement. We just are very um, humbled by the process, and the Lord has done an amazing work. And we just want to be faithful. We don't know what the next 100 days, I mean, someone could come in and say, all schools are closed again, right? I mean, that could happen. But again, we made the commitment every day, we'll take it one day at a time. We're going to stay in constant communication with our families. We email them almost every day. We, we had meetings where we communicated with them. Um, and they wanted that and they asked for that. And that's something easy we can do. And so when you get to the end and you're like, man, we made it 40 plus days and now we have a settlement. And it took a lot of gin putting up with my garbage <laughs> to keep me focused on getting to a settlement because there were a lot of things that early on we just said, no, we're not interested. And she's like, well, time out. Let's, let's talk this through and let's, and so I'm indebted to Jen because she's dealt with my difficult personality and helped me and the admin team to kind of talk through this and reach a settlement, which even the Christian schools that I've been talking to up and down the state, when I told them we had a settlement, they couldn't believe it. Like, really? Yeah, we did. We, we, we settled and we're good with it. And I think the state and county is good with it. And so... That's, that's just been an amazing thing to look back on and, and see how far we've come. But we've done it in partnership with our families. Hopefully you can put a bow on it then, right? That is settlement. That is, yeah. We can wrap this yes. package, put a bow on it. and That is our hope. Yeah. yeah, I can't control what other people do. I can control what we do. We're following our new return to school plans or updated ones with the adjustments in there, which weren't a ton, but they were, the mask thing was hard for us. Um, we, we've, we've, we've held up our end of the bargain, and I believe the county and state will too, but I can't control what they do. Thank you both for your time. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I would speak to schools that are in a similar situation. I mean, statewide, there are so many schools that are still there. And I guess as I've been talking to schools the last couple of weeks, I've really held up Ryan and the board, Andy, the leadership here, the admin team, as examples of the right way to do it. And I think that's because they came to the right decision for them and they stuck to it and they held to that goal and they kept it in mind through all the difficulties, through all just the whole thing. And it's been a process and how they communicated with their family and their community. This has been so challenging in so many Christian schools. And I think that there's so much that other schools can learn from Emmanuel pull up their reopening plan. It meets the state guidelines and it still allows for a ton of flexibility. Um, I just think there's a lot to be learned there. And the reopening plan, I think it's on their website. It is, both of them are. And I would just encourage schools to go pull it up because it is much different than I think what schools think they have to do. They're doing more than they have to under the guidelines. I think it is impacting education. And I would just encourage them, set your goals with your community and with your board um, like Emmanuel did and just stand behind your leadership. Ryan has been an amazing leader and um, it's been an honor to work with him through this process. Um, he can be difficult at times, but it's still an honor. I admit it. Um, 
And yeah, I would just go on there and take a look at it because I think they can learn a lot. All right, thanks both for your time. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you.